Last year, I took part in a pretty frustrating exchange in the comments section of a TikTok video. Part of my frustration stemmed from the fact that the person I was interacting with was ratioing me with every response they waged, and part of it was from the fact that I was a 24-year-old getting dragged in a TikTok comment section by someone who was most likely a teenager. The video in question featured a girl doing a haul of a bunch of tank tops that she had bought on AliExpress, a Chinese retail company notorious for mass-producing poorly made garments at astonishingly low prices, as well as duping the hard work of small designers and businesses. There were a few comments here and there telling the girl that she shouldn't be promoting fast fashion, especially a company like AliExpress, but the vast majority of comments were coming to her defense. So the exchange went something like this. Not everyone can afford to dress sustainably, guys. Let people live. That's not an excuse, though. That's so classist. Stop telling poor people they can't wear nice clothes. Not sure how that's classist. There are many ways to practice sustainability that don't include shopping fast fashion. Wow. This girl thinks everybody's rich. Not all of us are rich enough to live in the city. Not all of us have thrift stores on every block. She's out here shaming poor people, lol. Like, what the fuck? Okay, maybe I worded it wrong. When I said that's not an excuse, I mean it's not an excuse for overconsumption. I get people might not have access to alternatives, but it doesn't mean we have to promote overconsumption like this girl's doing. Okay, classist. It's really not worth debating with you if you're gonna keep saying that. Classist. Yo, at Marx's left nut, check out this classist. Ew. Classist. 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 That's more or less the crux of it. The most annoying part was that Mommy Socialist 2003's comments got upwards of 100 likes and mine capped in at around 10. Eventually, I got too frustrated, stopped responding, and deleted my account out of embarrassment. Mommy Socialist 2003 was repeating a popular argument about fast fashion, which posits that the sustainability movement by and large ignores the needs of working class people who are unable to afford sustainably produced garments. And I think it's an interesting one to dissect because, well, when you think about it, the people in the global south who are being exploited to make the clothing sold by fast fashion companies are just as, if not more poor, than the poor people Mommy Socialist 2003 was advocating for. Poor people from the global north, that is. From the Dhaka garment factory collapse in 2013, to the 2020 murder of garment worker Jayashri Kathraville, to the generally unlivable wages paid to people in these countries who make our clothes, it's pretty widely understood by now that with cheap clothes in your local mall comes the great suffering of someone overseas, not to mention the disastrous effects the fast fashion industry has on our climate. So why are Mommy Socialist 2003 and other people who use this argument so concerned with whether or not poor people in the global north should be able to shop at fast fashion retailers? I think it raises a really interesting conversation about global poverty and the cultural divide between the global north and south. Was Mommy Socialist 2003 right that, by virtue of lower class status, a consumer living in the global north is absolved from the social responsibility of their purchases? Were the people defending this haul video correct in thinking that, since corporations are the ones to blame, the onus should never lie on individual citizens, particularly impoverished ones? Really, what does poverty under late capitalism mean anyway? Maybe this is all more complicated than the 150 characters of a TikTok comment can convey. Like much more complicated, shall we? This video is sponsored by Native. I've been on the market for plastic-free body products for a while now, particularly a good deodorant. That's where Native comes in. With their plastic-free deodorants made from paperboard, Native has added a more sustainable twist to their regular formula. But not only is this plastic-free deodorant more sustainable, it's also aluminum and paraben-free, as well as vegan and cruelty-free. Each deodorant is made with familiar and simple ingredients like shea butter and coconut, and you can choose from a gorgeous range of scents. So far, I've gotten lilac and white tea, which is quite floral and fragrant, and aloe and green tea, which smells super fresh and clean. But my personal favorite is coconut and vanilla because I'm typically drawn to muskier scents. 
You should also check out their new limited edition holiday scents, sugar cookie, candy cane, and fresh mistletoe, all of which come plastic free. I've found that the deodorants aren't sticky at all and they dry quite quickly. They're also great for all day wear, even if you've been exercising. Native is a proud partner of 1% for the planet, committing 1% of sales from their plastic free deodorants to environmental nonprofits. If you're looking to be more sustainable, you'll find it right here. Three plastic free deodorants are normally $39, but if you use my link and code BROWIE, you'll get them for $29. That's 25% off. Again, that's code BROWIE, and you'll get three plastic free deodorants for 25% off. So thank you, Native, for sponsoring this video. The global south is a bit of an outdated term. The countries it refers to are as culturally, religiously, politically, and geographically different as you can get. Yes, many of them aren't even in the southern hemisphere. Yet the only things that bring them together under the moniker of global south is that they were one, once colonized, and two, are now relatively impoverished. But what makes the global south a useful term is that its countries are always understood in relation to countries that are wealthier than them, otherwise known as the global north. So if the global south encompasses most countries in Asia, Central America, South America, Mexico, Africa, the Middle East, and parts of Eastern Europe, then the global north encompasses Australia, Canada, all of Western Europe, and Russia, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, and the US. At some point in your life, you may have heard these regions be referred to as the first and third world. These terms were first coined by French demographer Alfred Sauvé when he wrote Three Worlds, One Planet in a 1952 article published in L'Observateur magazine. Sauvé was referring to a perceived division between three worlds, first, second, and third, that was created during the Cold War era as people saw an increased disparity in economic growth between the Western and Eastern blocs and the supposed underdeveloped rest of the world. When we hear about the global south, or the then third world, it's usually under the guise of bringing these poor, distant folks up to speed with the rest of us. Donate to the sad, starving child in Zimbabwe, and maybe one day he'll own a TV. But we're rarely told why this child is starving in the first place. That's where Sir Walter Rodney comes in. In 1973, Rodney published a groundbreaking book called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, in which he meticulously breaks down bit by bit the centuries-long process by which Africa became the way it is today. In most former colonies, including Rodney's and my own home country of Guyana, Europeans entered with the express purpose of resource and labor exploitation. The metropoles were able to quickly industrialize thanks to the extraction of raw materials like coal, oil, sugar, cotton, or cocoa, all of which were being extracted for cheap through the massive systems of slavery and indentured servitude. For developmentalism scholars like Rodney, Arturo Escobar, Amartya Sen, and Majid Ranima, Europeans, with their mission to civilize the people of these lands, stripped these regions of their robust indigenous community networks and subsistence economies. Jump to the mid-20th century at the height of the Cold War, and the former metropoles, along with North America, were now scrambling to instill capitalist democracies everywhere they could. But when it came time for these regions, now the third world, to become independent democratic nation-states, they no longer had their indigenous structures to keep them afloat. They were now expected to participate in the global market economy, but at this point, they had already been participating in this economy for centuries, just on the grounds of exploitation. What Rodney wants us to understand is that there would be no economic prosperity or development of the first world without the continued underdevelopment of the third world. This long history of deliberate underdevelopment has had a dire impact on the people who inhabit countries in the global south, particularly those who are both economically and culturally marginalized within their own communities. Impoverished people in the global south, particularly impoverished women, experience a sort of double oppression. Not only are they oppressed by income, by gender, by caste in the case of India, or by all three together, they're also oppressed in the context of global imperialism. Gayatri Spivak, a renowned scholar of postcolonialism, characterizes people who experience this double oppression as subaltern. In her controversial 1983 essay, Can the Subaltern Speak?, Spivak criticizes Western liberals and intellectuals for their compulsion to speak on behalf of subaltern people. She says, Imperialism's image as the establisher of the good society is marked by the espousal of the woman as object of protection from her own kind. The crux of Spivak's argument is that to be subaltern is to be voiceless. Through the marginalizing systems of imperialism and systemic impoverishment, subaltern people are silenced. Here's Spivak again. The invocation of the worker struggle is baleful in its very innocence. 
It is incapable of dealing with global capitalism, the subject production of worker and unemployed with the nation-state ideologies in its center, the increasing subtraction of the working class in the periphery from the realization of surplus value and thus from humanistic training in consumerism, and the large-scale presence of paracapitalist labor as well as the heterogeneous structural status of agriculture in the periphery. The current capitalist model of global exploitation would be unrecognizable to Daddy Marx. Spivak is speaking to the fact that subaltern people have been so marginalized, so exploited, and so silenced that they simply can't revolt in this current world order. Contrary to what Marxist scholars envision when they talk about class consciousness and seizing the means of production. This is a key factor in how Western companies are so easily able to get away with exploiting subaltern people today. Okay, so we look back on colonialism and we think, wow, that was really bad. But sorry to tell you that it's still kind of a thing and that if you live in the global north, you're actively participating in it. This might be old news to some of you, but I think it's important not to diminish the very clear parallels between colonization and the current system of global capitalism. One useful guide to understanding this idea is the world systems theory, developed by economic historian Emanuel Wallerstein. It basically argues that the global market economy operates something like this. The global north extracts resources and cheap labor from the global south to produce goods, which are then sold for cheap all over the world for surplus value. This became more prevalent than ever during the 80s with the introduction of free trade, where import and export tariffs were vastly dropped and goods became much cheaper as a result. Multinational corporations went hog wild for this and started outsourcing the production of goods at ever increasing rates. Western consumers also went crazy for this since they can now fulfill all their material desires. It came full circle. Western societies want economic prosperity, just use the global south to get it. So this is where the fast fashion industry comes in. The industry is a perfect case study for the global north-south dynamic. Its history is pretty blurry, but it can be chalked up to three major events in the past two or three centuries. Industrialization, globalization, and free trade. With the advent of the sewing machine in 1846 during the Industrial Revolution in Britain, the world saw a major uptick in the production of global textiles. According to Sven Beckert, cotton textile production was the first major industry in human history that lacked locally procured raw materials. Both the Brits and Americans were thriving off the backs of enslaved people in the US whose free labor on plantations was used to produce cotton at unprecedented rates. Even in the global north, poorly regulated factories began replacing local dressmakers who had employed small teams of skilled garment workers. Now the job was opened to unskilled workers as well. In 1911, a garment factory in New York caught fire and killed 146 workers. This led to legislation of better regulations for American factories. But instead of actually adhering to these new rules, the fashion industry instead worked quickly to move their factories overseas where there were less restrictions. According to a 2015 documentary called The True Cost, one in six people today work in the global fashion industry, which makes it the most labor dependent industry out there. And modern fashion's origins in the cruel exploitation of labor would have a major impact on how it evolved into what it is today. Industrialization by and large ramped up the production of textiles around the world. But although factories were popping up all over the place and textile technology was constantly being innovated, fashion in the 20th century did not see as big a boom as you'd expect. The trend cycle was slowly starting to churn, but it wasn't until the late 1990s that we'd see it explode. The fashion industry has become virtually unrecognizable from what it was just 20 odd years ago. This is largely thanks to globalization and free trade, where, like I said earlier, the production and exchange of goods became a cakewalk for multinational companies. It's also thanks to significant innovations in the global fashion supply chain. The original supply chain model was such that retailers would have to place orders for an entire season, of which there were four a year. But with consumer demands changing so quickly, retailers were unable to keep up. In the 20th century, high fashion was much less accessible to middle and lower class people. But now, rather than large quantities of low product differentiation, this new model boasts smaller quantities of higher product differentiation, which means that middle classers are getting off the runway high fashion looks at much faster rates for much lower costs. According to writer and activist Aja Barber, fast fashion has four distinct characteristics. One, it offers low prices for consumers. Two, it relies on short manufacturing periods. Three, it produces extremely trendy products, typically through the micro trend cycle. And four, its garments can be distinguished by their disposability. This is called planned obsolescence, where products are intentionally designed to have short lifespans. This creates a necessity for you to come back and buy more goods. Think about your iPhone's battery conveniently breaking every four years. 
With this new supply chain model, which has expanded the trend cycle from four seasons to upwards of 50 a year, people of all socioeconomic backgrounds can look like they stepped off the runway. And this has really altered consumer behavior. Now we feel entitled to the latest fashions for the cheapest prices, because all in all, these purchases give us very high but temporary satisfaction. I mean, huge disclaimer, I myself crack and buy fast fashion every once in a while. I do own those ridiculous IMG a whale tail pants, and I got a huge thrill when I bought them. The way fast fashion operates is basically commodity fetishism at its finest. I've seen TikTok videos of girls dancing in the most basic pink t-shirts, and all the comments are like, oh my god, where did you get that? The shirt could be the most rudimentary pattern you can imagine, but the point isn't that it's a simple piece of fabric that doesn't even have sleeves. The point is that this specific t-shirt from Zara or something is perceived by the consumer to have some innate spiritual value. This top, sold to us by our friendly local Zara, becomes a symbol of status through the cycle of consumerism. In the words of retail economist Victor Leblo, Our enormously productive economy demands that we make consumption our way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals, that we seek our spiritual satisfaction, our ego satisfaction, in consumption. We need things consumed, burned up, replaced, and discarded at an ever-accelerating rate. As I'm sure most of you have heard by now, this new consumer mindset has had a catastrophic effect on the climate, and we have the fashion industry to thank for that. A 2021 report by the World Economic Forum found that the fashion supply chain is the third largest polluter in the world, releasing 5% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. But if that doesn't fill you with enough existential dread, let me throw a few more statistics your way. As of 2019, we consumed 62 million metric tons of apparel. 57% of all discarded apparel ends up in landfills, where they're then incinerated, releasing dangerous emissions into the atmosphere. And that's just the end of the process. The fashion industry consumes one-tenth of all the water industrially, and is thus responsible for 20% of all wastewater worldwide. The fast fashion industry also relies on synthetic materials because they're cheaper to work with, but they take a way longer time to break down than natural materials and release a ton of carbon emissions. I could go on, but if you really want to get depressed, just watch the true cost for more information. The populations that'll be most severely and urgently affected by the damage we're doing to our climate are poor populations living in the global south, many of whom are already exploited and abused to keep this industry going. According to Dana Thomas, author of Fashionopolis, fewer than 2% of garment workers earn a living wage. And that's not discounting their working conditions, which I touched on earlier. This garment industry veteran says she is paying a high price for her job. <laughs> ຈຶ່ງເລີຍຄາບດໍໂດຍທາກາບບົນເຈົ້າຊົ່ງມີຈຶ່ງເລີຍຕະເປລະເລີຍມີຈຶ່ງເລີຍເຊີນຖ້າ
This attitude of denial and indifference to the distant other on the part of the spectator is known as compassion fatigue and is often held responsible for corroding the potential for civil action in public life. Not only do images of suffering in the global south produce feelings of apathy and hopelessness, they also place all responsibility into the hands of the individual. Yes, we're all complicit as consumers in the ongoing colonial project of global capitalism, but you don't see any of these humanitarian campaigns calling out multinational companies for their roles in this problem. All we see is crying children and a finger pointed directly at us. Which brings us to the talking point. The amount of times I see this take on Twitter, Friendly reminder that telling everyone to boycott fast fashion is classist. There's no ethical consumption under capitalism, and not everyone can afford to shop sustainably. Naturally, this is considered a hot take, because beforehand, it was pretty well understood that climate disaster and the flagrant abuse of human rights was inherently bad. For a while, sustainable fashion was accepted as a universal good. Yet this take comes in and says, well, actually, sustainable brands are unaffordable. We have poverty in the global north as well, and it's not the responsibility of the average low-income consumer to end global labor exploitation. So I want to give this take a fair shake. It's true that sustainable brands can be really pricey, and they don't offer very big size ranges, which excludes major segments of the population from shopping with them. But I think before we tackle this debate, we need to gain a comprehensive understanding of what poverty means and how it's evolved around the world. On the measurement of global poverty, people from the global south are clearly more financially impoverished than lower income people in the global north. Yet this hot take prioritizes the latter. Why? Our current understanding of poverty, like fast fashion, is fairly new. According to Majid Ranima, the word poor today is more similar to pauperism than it is to its own linguistic origins. Right now, to be poor is to be the opposite of rich. But throughout history, the concept of poverty had a variety of connotations. In many cultures, poorness could be falling from your estates, being deprived of the instruments of your labor, losing your social status, a lack of protection, exclusion from your community, abandonment, infirmity, or public humiliation. Bernima uses a few specific examples of what poorness meant in the pre-industrial world. For the Swana people of South Africa, poorness was measured by your relationship with locusts. In this society, rich people were disgusted by locusts because they ate all the grass that their cattle were supposed to eat. Poor people, on the other hand, who did not have cattle, loved locusts because they valued them as a nutritional option for food. In the Western world, a poor person was a respectable individual who stood in danger of losing their birth. In the Eastern world, there was an entire social group called the voluntary poor, who were respected by their societies for their ability to live without material goods. But beginning in the Victorian era, governments started placing a moralistic stance on poverty with the invention of the pauper, a person who needed to rely on outside institutional assistance for their basic necessities. Poverty and pauperism became conflated, and being poor was now measured based on what you lacked in relation to those who had more capital than you. This was introduced on a global scale in 1949, when Harry Truman said in a presidential address that poverty in the second and third worlds was a disability that only the wealthy nations could remedy. This was also right around when the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank were established, which measured countries in the same way they would measure paupers domestically. Now there was an actual calculation for poorness, where entire countries could be deemed poor if their per capita income was below a new universal minimum. National economic growth was now believed to be the only logical way to alleviate material deprivation. What made this worse was that the newly invented third world wasn't given a fair shake when it came to economic growth. Scholar Arturo Escobar compares development in the third world to the post-war reconstruction of Europe. European countries that had been ravaged in the war were not expected to pay organizations back for reconstruction. But in the third world, development came at a price in the forms of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, otherwise known as the World Bank, and later structural adjustment loan programs offered by the IMF, which placed these newly developing nations under massive debt. As any country with an annual per capita income below $100 was now considered poor, the global south, who were now drowning in debt, became the poster child of global poverty. Literally. 
What we should take away from this is that poverty was now only being judged on a global scale as material deprivation, mainly from an income perspective. And this focus on income made it so that poverty in the global south was naturalized as some ahistorical universal truth rather than a social process. Since we are starting with a blank canvas on which to divide rich and poor, the reality of deliberate wealth accumulation and resource exploitation that had been happening in the global south for centuries was made invisible. This income perspective continues to dominate our ideas about the Global South, and it's why this hot take about fast fashion and classism seems so new. When we think of poverty, we immediately think of the Global South. Think about it. We in the Global North are always referencing those starving children in Africa to eschew any conversation about poverty in our own countries. Candy, will you eat? There are starving people in China. But thankfully, my boy Amartya Sen swooped in in the early 90s to complicate things a bit. For Sen, poverty is not just some sort of innate lack of money. It's a social thing that's completely dependent on the environment and the ability of a person to cover the basic necessities of life within the social conditions of that environment. He calls this a deprivation of capabilities. This capability perspective expands how we understand the causes behind poverty, and it's all about the ends people have reason to pursue and correspondingly to the freedoms to be able to satisfy those ends. Within this framework, many countries in the North, he argues, have as great a disparity and as acute a poverty as many countries in the global South. It's all relational. He says, being relatively poor in a rich country can be a great capability handicap, even when one's absolute income is high in terms of world standards. In a generally opulent country, more income is needed to buy enough commodities to achieve the same social functioning. Since the social standards of living are so high in wealthier countries, it takes a lot to keep up with. He uses the example of the US, where in most places, it's almost mandatory to own a car. So it's at this point that I could see validity in the whole sustainability as class as talking point. Fast fashion has democratized style. That was the founder of Zara, Amancio Ortego Gaona's entire mantra. People from all socioeconomic walks of life were now able to purchase fashions seen on the runway. So yes, this means that lower income people can afford more styles for less. Fast fashion through its innovative supply chain has offered a solution to the capabilities perspective. The core idea here is that fast fashion allows poor people in the global north the ability to participate in the high social demands of their opulent societies. Makes sense, but... What do people mean when they say there's no ethical consumption under capitalism? Well, this phrase came about to describe the paradox of ethical consumption. Capitalism, where the few accumulate wealth off the backs of the many, is an inherently unethical system. So when people urge others to consume ethically, they're placing the onus on individual citizens to remedy the ills of major corporations. I can buy all the reusable Nalgene's I want, but Nestle is still farting out single-use plastics at an ever-accelerating rate. I can go vegan and completely swear off purchasing animal products, but Canada's still killing over 800 million living creatures in slaughterhouses each year. And the worst part is, trying to consume ethically is pretty expensive. If you're a single working mom in Wisconsin with four kids, you're not gonna be able to afford free range chicken for the whole family or a $19 package of Beyond Meat pork cutlets. There are basic necessities of life that working class people don't have the time or money to be avoiding for the sake of ethics. So I agree that it's tone deaf to ask working class people to right all the wrongs of multinational corporations, especially when it comes to products that they need to survive in this society. But that's the key word here, survival. What did Sen say? A family in contemporary America or Western Europe may find it hard to take part in the life of the community without possessing some specific commodities, such as a telephone, a television, or an automobile that are not necessary for community life in poorer societies. Here's the thing. Sometimes brands like to convince us we need things that we actually don't. Cars, sure, we need them to get around. Cell phones, yeah, it's pretty hard to exist in Western society without one. I need shoes to protect my feet. I need a coat to keep me warm in the winter. But there are things we don't need. Take the beauty industry, for example. These guys are out here telling me that I'm gonna get old and ugly really soon, and the only thing I can do to stop it is to buy this Origins Clear Improvement Zero Oil Cleanser with charcoal, or this 432 Rifa Carat Ray Roller Device. I'm gonna age whether I like it or not, so I really could just slap some regular drugstore soap on my face, look the exact same, and spend the $400 on my exorbitant rent instead. But that's not how it works. 
In the TikTok I had commented on, the girl was doing a haul of about eight basic different tank tops in different colors that she had ordered from across the world, in an effort to achieve a certain style that was trending at the moment, something like one of Bella Hadid's little tank big cargoes looks. This was not a necessity purchase, yet people were in the comments acting as though she was clothing herself and four kids for the long winter. And even if that was the case, why is it necessary to purchase eight small items which need to be shipped all the way from China instead of buying something almost identical from the local mall? So Sen is right that poor people in opulent countries have a much harder time keeping up with their wealthy peers, but this argument can be abused. The main goal of marketing is to identify a lack in society and then argue that your product can fulfill that lack. But what sets the fashion industry apart is that it creates the lack. Ranima is super useful here. He says that within capitalist systems, the elite class has created a cult of envy, where the masses buy into aspirations of wealth, opulence, and status. Corporations prey on that envy and instill this false idea that the only way to exist in society is to buy their products. Take for example the TV. In mid-century America, companies brainwashed people into thinking that possessing a TV was a sign of progress, transforming it from an entertainment object to a basic need. In Ranima's words, Modern economized societies tend to define their poor in accordance with their capacity to absorb the commodities and services they produce, and in the context of a system equally producing scarcity. The modernized poor are thus no longer persons eventually lacking the minimum necessaries, but entire groups of people perpetually caught in the rat race between their imputed needs and their increasing lack of resources. With the trend cycle going from four to upwards of 50 seasons a year, fast fashion companies are constantly moving the goalpost and we keep chasing it. This is where I'll drop Ranima's best quote. The fate of the new poor is a sentiment of abandonment and severance from those with whom they could relate as human beings, and the prospect of a lifelong humiliation and disablement as doomed losers. That's what poverty means in this sustainability as classes take. It's not about being materially deprived. It's about the rat race. The only true consequence of which is social humiliation. And this applies to all levels of social strata, since the poor are not the only demographic that even shops at fast fashion retailers. The middle class do too. Hell, Lana fucking Del Rey wore a Shein dress on the red carpet just the other week. So when we break down this tweet, friendly reminder that telling everyone to boycott fast fashion is classist. There's no ethical consumption under capitalism and not everyone can afford to shop sustainably. What it reads to me is, the inalienable right for every social class to be fashionable is more important than the inalienable right not to be exploited and abused by corporations. Almost worse, it's more important than the right to live without a breathing mask in 50 years, or to not drown in a freak flood. To be able to plan a family without existential dread about bringing life into a world that's currently dying. Please don't log off and immediately go yell at a low-income person for buying jeans at Topshop. That's not my intention here. What I want us to do with this video is provide context and nuance to an otherwise oversimplified online debate. Being anti-fast fashion isn't inherently classist, just as buying one pair of jeans from Topshop doesn't make you an inherently terrible person. We can't force everybody to completely opt out of their purchasing habits because not everyone can afford to do so. But it's important that we in the global north at least try. There's power in numbers, and the more of us that stand up against an incredibly harmful system, the more likely it is to fall, or at least change in some meaningful way. Forever 21 folded, let's keep it going, babes. There's a ton of great videos on here that explain how we can shop more consciously, understand the cost of labor behind garment making, vote with our dollars, and sidestep the trend cycle. So I'm not gonna go into that. If you wanna know more, you can check out Minale's video, TikTok is kinda bad for fashion, or Kristen Leo's entire channel, really. I just wanna end this by thinking about how the phrase criticizing fast fashion as classist is perfectly suited for the shallow, fast, and temporary spaces of Twitter and TikTok. Character limitations and fickle algorithms breed reductiveness. At first glance, especially if you're scrolling quickly, the hottest, flashiest takes will look like they just ended a debate in a couple short sentences. But the world and the many interweaving processes it operates on are way too complicated to be whittled down to 150 characters. 
Writing a pithy tweet with a flashy word like classism is not the mic drop we think it is. I find these kinds of takes are a lot like the humanitarian campaigns I talked about earlier. They expose the suffering, but they offer no solutions. Like, yeah, poor people in the global north are poor and they shop fast fashion. You've exposed that, but what now? If we all just joined hands and chanted, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, while marching through the mall and filling our shopping bags, nothing would ever change. For any of us. I'm sorry to say it, but the road to revolution will not be paved with Shein clothes. Special thank you to Louis Osta, Syed Hassan, Malpertui, Cooper Stimson, Nina E., James Barcelona, Tenzing Mingmar, Jessica, Nadia C., Greg Peter, Rubbish Robot, Daniel, Francesca Downs, and Nina Ray for supporting this channel.